Hey, everybody. We're back here on the Fanatic Wrestling Podcast, and we are here with Matt McDonough, the uh, uh, fantastic Matt McDonough from our website, one of our instructors. Matt, this is a first for me. I've never uh, podcasted with a guy who's in a sauna. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, we're wrestlers, so I think all grappling sports, this is kind of like your second home is sitting in the knees and stretching and uh, making your body feel better. This is like a very, like, if I were to imagine Matt McDonough, I imagine him sweating his tail off somewhere. So this is actually kind of perfect. This is a... Now a I just do it for theory. fun. Nothing other than uh, an addiction, so to speak. When did you start using Asana for recovery and that kind of thing? So ironically enough, um, I, I used one well before the age of, like, cutting weight. I, I didn't cut weight as a little kid, which we can get into later. But as a youth, I never lost anything. But my dad worked at a law firm, and for whatever reason, the law firm they worked at had a sauna in the basement. So he'd bring me in there, and I'd get to sit in the sauna with him, and that's how I kind of got introduced to it, um, and really just kind of the, the, the whole aspect of sitting in here and stretching and, you know, making your body feel good, but then also a little bit of mental toughness always goes into it because it's not like something like this is an overly comfortable environment. Yeah, saunas are a little bit of an acquired taste, right? Like, so for the first so many times that you get in there, it is very uncomfortable, but then eventually your body gets used to it and you start to see the positive effects. Can you tell me some of the positive effects that, you know, you're getting from being in the sauna? I mean, number one, first and foremost, is just, uh, I wouldn't, it's so broad, but recovery, um, you know, the positive effects, I would say, is the heat on your muscles and your joints. You know, you go through a lot of very rigorous training and it's hard to loosen up. You know, once your muscles um, contract and start to spasm, it's hard to loosen up. So just very first off the top of my head, loosening up, you know, you tend to get very sore, a lot of lactic acid, very tight muscles after hard workouts. And a sauna is just a way to, uh, you know, kind of decrease the effects of that. Um, and, and then also I very um seldom thought of for younger athletes but just heart health you know it's a it's a passive workout essentially because you're heating your body up enough that your heart has to increase its heart rate because of the environment and so now your blood is circulating better and um you know obviously that's just helping your heart and helping your circulation helping recovery and we could go into i mean dozens of little ones the one i like the most for wrestling outside of recovery is just that mental toughness aspect um and you know that really you think about it it's it's about doing something that you don't want to do when you don't want to do it your first instinct after a couple minutes is to get out of the sauna because it's hot but when you train your mind to stay in there now you're improving your resilience to uncomfortable situations and that could that's so broad ranging that's the beauty of it but that is something that you put like thought into, like how do I get myself mentally tougher? And you sought out exercises that would do that. Absolutely, absolutely. It starts out at youth where you have coaches who push you, and that's external. We all know about external motivators, um, and the coaches push you. And if you have have great leadership, you start to learn that you can do that on your own. And once you do that, then it's about what we're talking about finding extra ways to improve your mental toughness, to improve your conditioning, to improve your overall health. And that's where I'm adamant about saunas is that there is no denying that all those things happen when the purpose of using a sauna is correct. People talk about weight cutting in a sauna and if you truly are an advocate of the sauna, that happens one out of every thousand times you get into a sauna. You sit in a sauna for the sole purpose of losing weight. Mm -hmm. And I guess we should say that, you know, if this is something that people listening are considering, make sure you talk to your doctor, make sure you're really well hydrated before any of this. What are some other recovery tools or, or aspects that you have in your life, either now or when you were competing more regularly? You know, I've, lo I've lost track of it uh, of late. Uh, I'm trying to get better at it. But I think stretching is so under so underutilized in combat sports. I mean, you're you are literally 
taking another person and trying to impose your will on them. So you're trying to bend their joints and ligaments in ways that probably weren't meant to be um, done. And then we go and we take a shower and we go home. I mean, think about that. It's crazy. And you got other sports that aren't maybe quite as intense and they spend a long time stretching. And I think the wrestling community, and I, I would guess the jujitsu community is better with this, but the wrestling community is very much so like tough guy mentality. Mm-hmm. So if all these other sports are doing it, they don't always want to devote a lot of time to it because of being stretch. But I think stretching is invaluable. Look at the best wrestlers right now, the best grapplers, they, they all have a very good flexibility, tend to. And some of them, uh, Jaden Cox, that's a perfect example. That man is absolutely ripped out of his mind. He has muscles on every square inch of his body, but yet he can almost do the splits or can. I don't know exactly, but I mean, you see videos of him and the flexibility is outrageous. So how much of a benefit is it when you got guys like that who can do, you know, com- completely unique things simply because they devoted time and effort, especially in their youth, especially in their youth. I'm flexible. I still am. I've just gotten away from it since I've competed, but I believe it comes from your youth doing that when you're young, when you're developing. How young did you get started with that then? When was that introduced to you really uh, seriously? Um, boy, I would say probably, probably third grade, fourth grade, kind of if you think of middle school and puberty, probably a year or two before that time period in my life. Um, I started to do it. And then when you hit puberty and your body starts to change, you, you know, you can either never do stuff and lose a lot of flexibility or you can maintain and and gain a lot of flexibility. When, uh, uh, Matt, I want to get into your competitive career for sure. You know, uh, uh, Linmar High School, University of Iowa, multiple time national champion. Uh, But before then, you brought up BJJ a couple of times. Uh, You're somebody who was a high-level wrestler who's now starting to get into jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah. So a little bit of a life transition right now. But when I was in Madison, um, I was fortunate to have some people who kind of nudged me. And I started working out um, here and there. Not a lot of times, just, you know, on the side of coaching when I could. And, oh, man, it's one of those things where it's so – I mean, there is so much crossover and I don't say that is a diminishing to either sport, but there's crossover that jujitsu can come into wrestling and have some strong way and can certainly go to jujitsu and have some very strong skill sets. But since it's different enough, it's very stimulating to learn that new aspect, both for jujitsu people coming to wrestling and wrestling people coming to jujitsu. There's just enough, changes that it's extremely I mean I feel like every time I go I'm like trying to be a sponge you're back back to when I was a kid wrestling you're trying to be a sponge um because there's so much you don't know but it feels right you know that's where the crossover mm-hmm. is is that feels the same so it feels you're like man I can but I just don't know the techniques yet um I love it I think you know I think both communities would benefit from the crossover uh, of you know being multidisciplined. Um, and both communities could certainly benefit from mutual respect or, you know, uh, fan base of each sport. I really do. Man, I totally agree. Obviously, I'm going to say that, you know, I work for BJJ Fanatic slash Fanatic Wrestling, but I, I work for both because I love both. And I agree. I think there's a, a ton that we could uh, learn from each other as professional leagues. I think that we could learn a lot from each other in terms of like marketing and even just come together Absolutely. to share fan bases, I think there's a, a big possibility for that. Are you still a white That's belt what I or have you gotten a blue belt yet? I'm still a white belt. I haven't even – the problem is is I haven't gone – like I haven't know a lot of people who do jiu-jitsu. So I, I have a gi in my back or in my trunk, and if someone's around and uh, there's a free time to roll, I'll roll. Um, so it's really just learning from – at this point, learning from anyone I can. Uh, I think, you know, depending on – Um, where I move next and what I'll be doing for work. Uh, um, I would love to basically implement that along with wrestling as my, my, my own personal, you know, training and fitness. I think it'd be awesome. And um, you know, it's, uh, 
it's something that's that's fun. It's new and it's fun, and you know, everyone the new is always fun. But um, I have a lot of respect. I mean, bottom line, I have a ton of respect for uh, people that are a high level of jujitsu. It's a completely different animal, and I want to learn it because you know, constantly try to uh, grow your mind. So, and your training, yeah, I, I want to make sure people know, your training in the gi, in the, the cloth I, so karate jacket. The, the, the person that, um, his name is Jim Kelly. He's a black belt. He actually runs a jiu-jitsu club in uh, Iowa City called Citadel BJJ. I have to give him a shout out because he's just, he's a great guy. Um, been around the Iowa wrestling community. He actually moved from the East Coast to Iowa just for Iowa wrestling because he loved Iowa wrestling, wanted to be near it, and basically gave up jiu-jitsu um, for a, a time period and was working with uh, a kid's club that I actually worked with as well and did that for a long time. And just it just happened that he, uh, he was able to get back to his, you know, his number one passion, which is jiu-jitsu, and now he owns a school. Um, and I remember going in and always talking to him, I got to come in, I got to come in. This is, at this time, I was not living in Iowa anymore. And when I came back to Iowa City, I went in. And he basically, he, he let me borrow a gi, but he basically said for me, you know, you, you know no gi. That's what you do in wrestling very much. Um, so maybe try the gi for a while and learn because there's so many uh, – talking to more jiu-jitsu people, they're de definitely different. Like it's not one better than the other, but there's just – there's obviously a lot more to the gi when you add in a garment that you're using, mm -hmm. a lot more techniques. Um, no, even in jiu so you would say that. That's not, a, that, that's not controversial. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's more to so do. So there's a lot more techniques. And so I figured, well, shoot, I might as well learn this one because I, I got no idea this. And then I can always, you know, jump into a no-gi workout because that's pretty much what we do in wrestling. You know, no one's grabbing shirts or anything like that um, in wrestling. So, uh, I've done I've done mostly gi work and I love it just because that in that respect it is totally different than wrestling. Uh, I'm I'm actually very eager to get into my my first no gi like I mean I've done it like with a guy on the team you know in wrestling outfits no gi but get into a legit no gi workout with someone who's a jujitsu specialist and uh, just feel what it's like compared because that's the closest thing I mean shoot. We, we've seen, what, two or three matchups where jiu-jitsu, you're going at it in, a, in like a quasi jiu-jitsu grappling match. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's the clearly a hybrid crossover there. Yeah, hybrid, hybrid rules. I love it. Uh, so we're, you're starting to mention Iowa, and obviously you're a University of Iowa guy. Uh, and I think that people, when they think about University of Iowa, they have a certain idea in their head. Maybe call it a stereotype, right? The stereotypical Iowa wrestler. Uh, what is something that you think might surprise people about Iowa wrestling from somebody who's been on that inside there and, and been around the program? The, the workouts are all across the board. I think that would surprise a lot of people. People think it's just going there and warm up and just grind for two hours straight. Um, but it's ever evolving from a standpoint of the training types. I mean, one day you could be doing a 45 minute hard drill and then, you know, jump on a bike and do some, do some cardio. Uh, another day you could be, Hey, you're on your own. And it's just straight up. Like, you know, the system, you warm up, you drill hard, you wrestle live and then you do a little, maybe a little drilling or conditioning at the end. And then another day, it's the coaches from start to finish, like a totally structured, uh, very high octane, high pace workout with drilling, sparring, live, running, drilling, some lifting. So I think that would surprise people uh, that it's so, you know, there's so much uh, – every every day there's so much changing all the time um yeah I, I would say that would be one of the biggest one of the biggest things that that i noticed uh when you were there you were part of this long-term dynasty that everybody talks about where iowa is the place for lightweights it's 125 pounders 133 pounders even 141 pounders still is still is it's crazy it's it seemed to have a pretty good 25 uh i've heard nice things <laughs> what do you think? He's all right. He seems like he's doing pretty good stuff. 
So what, as somebody who has been in that dynasty, as somebody who is partially responsible for that, what do you owe that to? What do you think is, is happening there that's different from happening other places? I think you look at the coaching at that, you know, uh, two of the best lightweights in the history of Iowa wrestling, certainly, if not the entire country, um, are currently coaching at Iowa, Tom and Terry Brands. So you have to take that into account. And then I think just a culture of the lightweights, you know, I think it's, you've seen it a few times in a few other programs that you just it develop a culture of like, this is where you go, but it's not even about the recruiting. It's about after that, actually, when people get there, you're seeing the guy in front of you who you're training with every day, just absolutely rip tearing through the country. And it speaks to you. It really does. I mean, you see it and it's like, you know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go do that. That's my job next. And then there's that extra bit of pride of carrying on, I think, that torch. Um, but there's, you know, there's no denying that um, it's a great coaching staff that are very high level um, wrestlers. And I mean, I, I experienced it myself. They know how to, they know how to train somebody if they want to, they, you know, they, they, and they want to clearly because it keeps happening, happening, happening. Uh, but they, they know how to train guys to, to win, um, especially at, at that 125, 133, you know, category. I mean, you shoot, if we went through the numbers right now in the last decade, how many national titles, finalists, top three finishes at 25 and 33. I mean, it's probably outrageous. It's unbelievable. I mean, it, it's a top three guy almost every year and if it's not it's like a guy who will be a top three guy the next year you know what I mean the uh, only time I, I I just thought about it the only time someone at 125 has not placed for Iowa in the top five since 2010 when I won it was me in 2013 I didn't place I was around as well every other year you go first second first not placed fifth uh third no yeah Gilman I think third. took second he took third and then second and then right. third again or no no sorry fourth and then second and then third and then the last two years champs so you have 10 years and the lowest finish is fifth I mean that's incredible and that's just 25 you go to 33 it's darn near the same thing I mean it's crazy it's it's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely incredible. And something that really impresses me uh, anytime I see it, obviously winning a national title is always impressive, but winning a national title as a freshman uh, is extra impressive to me because it, it speaks to a readiness so early. You're somebody who won a national championship as a freshman. What do you think gave you that extra edge, especially in your first year of varsity competition? I think it was focusing on the right things. Um, I, I never really, I, I, and this sounds crazy, I dreamed of winning it, but I never really thought about it. I never really worried. It was not my, it was not my goal at the beginning of the year. It was my ultimate goal, but like in my mind, it was, I was very lucky to be only thinking about the next thing and just mostly just um, making my mark, you know, making my mark in that, Hey, I'm a young kid. I got something to prove. But again, it wasn't about the end of the year. It was about every match I had of just absolutely going out and putting on a show so that the country knew, hey, you're tough. You know, hey, this guy's legit. And then it's slow. Think of like a snowball. You know, you start the snowball, you roll it down the hill, it's small, and then it gets bigger, and then it gains momentum, and then it gets way bigger, and it's just exponential. And that's, that's what happened, you know, looking back, that's really what happened for me was I started off the year wanting to make a statement and then throughout the year, you know, wanted to make a statement. And then it was about climbing the ranks and then all of a sudden Big Tens is there and it's like, I want to win this tournament as a freshman. I want to do something that hasn't been done from Iowa for a long time. And, uh, and I don't know when, I just am saying a long time. It could have been relatively early or not that long ago, but mm -hmm. that was my thought. And then I lost it and shoot, if anything, losing that tournament helped me even more because it humbles you enough that you keep that same fire that you had from the beginning of the year of just, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to tear this next tournament up.
yeah, of course, winning is always on your mind, but it's all you care about. You're, you're destined to, to fail because you will forget what made you great. And what made you great is the, the, the desire to just, you know, be the best kick butt. So I always think it's interesting when somebody loses at the conference championship. I think it happens more often in the Big Ten than anywhere else. Uh, somebody loses at the Big Tens and then will turn around and win nationals. As somebody who has done that, what do you think the adjustment in that time period was? Was there an adjustment or was it just, you know, that nationals happen to be your day? I don't think it's as much as an adjustment. I mean, it is. There's it's technique things you adjust. Those are uh, obvious, like within the match technique. The main thing I see is an adjustment in your mentality. You get humbled a little bit, and it almost is like you if you if you handle the loss properly, it injects motivation right back into you. So you're losing, yes, on the scorecard, on your record, you're losing. And then on, and this is again for the people who do fall short and then overperform at nationals. And then they, they take that as just like a straight injection into their veins of I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the next tournament and I am going to turn some people's heads. I'm going to make some people take notice of me. And they do because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're fueled, they're hungry, they're inspired. They're inspired to do something good because they don't want to they don't want to have that same feeling again. And that's what happened to me both my freshman year. You know, I was so fueled to go just absolutely tear through the NCAA tournament. And then after my sophomore year in the finals of the cuz I won Big 10s, I got second at nationals. The same thing happened after that year. I was fueled and you know that helped give me extra purpose to my my junior year. Man, I, I think that's really interesting, that kind of that uh, – there was always another mountaintop, you know what I mean? I, I think that's a really kind of uh, interesting message. I would love, Matt, to talk a little bit about the product that you have on the site because even at the time, I remember thinking your sweep single leg was just so good and scoring on so many people. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the bread and butter sweep single leg, which is now available on fanaticwrestling.com. What was your idea with this series and, and what kind of stuff are you teaching on here? So for me, you know, being approached about doing a technique series was uh, flattering that, uh, hey, you got good enough technique. We want you to show it. And actually, I think you might have brought it. I was like, shoot, I mean, I, I can show anything. What would you like? Show something you're great at. And I've ne it's always almost been an, not an afterthought, but just a like second nature for me because I, I spent so long developing a single leg and not just the single leg, but everything that goes into getting a takedown. It is, if you look at statistics, it is probably the number one scoring move in all of wrestling. And I would be willing to bet it's up there for MMA and jiu-jitsu as well. It's a single leg. Grab, grab someone's leg and then go from there. You know, it's very broad ranging. But for me, the bread and butter sweep single is your absolute most basic shot, but also your highest percentage of finish rate. Um, for the vast majority of athletes out there. And what I tried to do was take everything I knew um, and break it down because people get very much um, over they, – they tend to overlook a single leg and all the intricacies of it sometimes because it's such a simple move, so to speak. But that's the thing. It's only simple if you make it simple. And I'm sure mm -hmm. the exact same thing happens in jiu-jitsu all the time where – there's a position um, and it's like, well, you do this. Well, if there are so many idiosyncrasies to the body position in combat sports that you could spend uh, 10 hours straight showing a single leg. And that is not enough to show every scenario that happens when you're wrestling someone and you're in a single. And that's what I wanted to do. I, and I shoot, I, I, you know, I didn't even have enough time to, to do that but I feel like I got a pretty good base for people when it came to the setups um, shots and shot drills that is very much overlooked people think it's just about getting to the leg you basically if you think of the single leg in four and five, four to five steps you basically skip 
two steps. If you're taking a good shot and you have proper penetration and you understand the, the, you know, the penetration drills and you understand how to put yourself in a finishing position right off of a shot. Um, that's what I think, you know, I really wanted to implement in there is teaching people the positional game of a single leg in that if you win the positional game, the techniques um, aren't irrelevant, but you don't, if you don't have the perfect technique, but you're in perfect position, chances are you're probably going to score. Um, you know, and that's, the, I took that from my own career, my, my collegiate career of getting into uh, single legs and just constantly wrestling them and never letting somebody, once I got a leg, it's almost like a mentality. You get a leg, I mean, you should never let that leg go. The only way that leg should be let go is if the ref stops the match. Other than that, you should never need to give an opponent's leg back. You worked that hard to get to it, and that's, you know, that's what mattered to me. But I had a bunch of fun. You know, I think the Bread and Butter Sweep Single Series could help a lot of people, um, especially uh, youth and middle school wrestling. Obviously, it can help every level, but – not learning a single leg just from the sense of, hey, shoot, grab a single. All right, finish. Like, that's, you're setting yourself up to have to relearn it again later. So if you learn it from a young age, very, very thorough, uh, you're going to benefit from it later on. There's a, sh there's a shift in mentality because I do a lot of these interviews and I get to talk to you guys. And I think there's an interesting shift between understanding if something's common, that doesn't mean it's simple. That means it's important. That is, that's so true. That is the biggest, I don't want to say issue, but the biggest thing I notice in youth wrestling is, or not even youth, but just uh, high school and below wrestling, is that people think a move, oh, a single leg. Yeah, I know how to do that. I'm good. You want to spend, I mean, if, if, if it's that common, it's probably important and you probably should spend a lot of time on it, but people instead want to spend a lot of time on very specialty positions because it's like a, like a way you can end a match quick. And I'm all about that too. But if you don't know the fundamentals first, you're innately going to have a flawed system for the very high level uh, specialized technique. I'm glad that you talked about how you hold on to that leg forever because that is like when I think of Matt McDonough wrestling, I think about how you might be the best guy I've ever seen It's still finishing with your arms fully extended above your head. That had to be really unusual for a lot of guys. Was that just like so frustrating for opponents? I think so. I think uh, they probably dislike that. I guess I haven't talked to a lot of them, but I can still visualize myself doing it. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, I hurt my shoulder. I don't know if it was because of that or not. Um, but I remember my first three years of college, man, I'd shoot a shot. People would sprawl as far as they could. And I would, I don't say I'd let them, but it didn't bother me if they did, because as long as my hands stayed locked, your leg is going to be mine. I'm going to take, I'm going to pull your leg into my chest and then I'm going to take you down. And I, I can say with 100%, Honestly, I don't know where exactly I learned it. I'm sure an accumulation of a lot of people teaching me a lot of uh, stuff and just practice. But it was almost one of those like light bulb moments, you know, when, all right, he, he sprawls hard. And it started in high school, but he sprawls hard. And, man, if I keep my hands locked and just learn how to basically do like a, like a, you know, like a rope climb, like a really long extended row, I can just pull a leg in. Cause I got a good grip so he can't break my grip. I'll just pull his leg into me. And that's what I would do. And sure enough, I, I started to master that skill. And man, if I got in on a shot and my hands were locked, someone was in trouble. That was just the way it was, you know, but the beauty of it is uh, there's always more to learn. It wasn't the perfect technique because I, I had an injury. So now I can't do it. Guess what? Well, you got to learn a new technique. So I learned more ways to get takedowns and I can still do it now. Um, my shoulders are a lot healthier now. I can still do that. But um, I know just from my experience that, shoot, that's just one of many. There, there's, you know, maybe two, three, four other ways if you don't end up in the position you want to wrestle through it and still stay on a leg. I totally agree. I want to talk, uh, talk to you a little bit about the section of the series that you have on finishing the single leg. 
I feel like there's there's a million ways to finish a single leg, but for the most part, people try to elevate it or people, and I would say elevation is probably what's most commonly taught. Uh, but you on this teach finishing backside and like trying to catch an angle on that. Do you prefer that yes. versus elevating the ankle? Is there a reason beyond that, that's behind that? I prefer that very much so. And the reason I prefer it is because a smaller, you don't need to be stronger than someone to get behind them. You need position and position is leverage and leverage is strength. Um, so if you have superior position on someone, you are, you are mitigating their strength. You know, you are uh, working around their strength. Um, now, if you have the ability um, and if it, you can do it clean, I think coming up, elevating the ankle and coming up through to your feet is always a great way simply because, you know, you put someone on one leg, they're at a severe disadvantage. Um, but for me, I just – I always knew I, if I stayed on the mat that I could wrestle through it. If I came up, I'm either going to finish or he's going to end up on his feet. And for me, that's where that mentality came in. Once I got to his leg, I never wanted him to get, get his leg back ever. I don't care. I'll stay down there. I want to stay on your leg because it's going to be just as uncomfortable for you as it is for me to have someone on your leg as it is for me to hold on to a leg. Um, and that's where I'm, a strong believer in backside finishes. And you know what? I'm probably in the minority as far as wrestling goes, but that's okay. You know, it's okay because uh, nobody is wrong. I mean, you you know, a backside finish is worth two points. An elevated finish is worth two points, you know? That's right. I think where it becomes a little more contentious is in freestyle. Um, Mm. It's very much more beneficial in freestyle to come up through your feet. And then if you lose the shot, so what? Or you can run it out of bounds. Whereas if you stay on the mat, there's a chance you could get rolled. Um, but in folk style and in jujitsu, that's really of no major worry um, because you're not getting losing points by rolling through your back. You're losing points by giving up control. And that's why I feel very strongly about a backside finish. Once you get someone's leg, don't give that thing back. That's, that's your leg now. That's your leg. That's not their leg anymore. You own it. As soon as you, as soon as you lock your hands on that thing, he never gets it back. That's the way I like to wrestle. I love it. Matt, earlier you mentioned something about uh, cutting weight. And like you said, uh, you know, using a sauna to cut weight. Do you remember what you were talking about with that? Yeah. So people will hate saunas. You'll get youth wrestlers who despise saunas because the only thing associated with it is going in there with sweats on and jumping rope or riding a bike or just sitting there, just sitting there against their will, like you, hey, you have to be in here for 10 minutes. You know, I've done that to myself, and I've had it done to me where someone said you got to stay in for so long. But the purpose was never really about cutting weight. Maybe a couple times in my life, and you know what? Those few times are, are actual torture. I mean, it is, you are sitting in a horrible environment, and horrible, I love it right now, but you are sitting in a very horrible environment not a not livable environment for a disclosed amount of time against your will for the sole purpose of losing weight. It just, you think about that and it just, it doesn't make sense when if you can't go run or wrestle or grapple or lift weights or jump rope, or I could keep going on and on. If you can't do one of those things and lose the weight, guess what? Chances are you're probably losing too much weight. That's the way I was taught. Um, you know, that's the way my dad taught me from his coaches. Um, you know, I remember my dad always saying from coach Gable, um, cause my dad, coach Gable, uh, coach Dan Gable was one of my dad's assistant coaches. And I remember my dad always telling me when I was young, he'd, he'd say, hey, coach Gable, I said, if you're, uh, if you're working hard enough, you'll be at the right way. And it's not kind of a funny little statement, but if you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Like. If you're working hard enough day to day, your weight's probably not going to be an issue. If it is, you're probably not at the right weight. But there's a lot more to that, too, when you're on a high-level, you know, collegiate team or something. There's, you know, doing things for a team, for a teammate, for a team perspective as well. Nonetheless, I don't think – I'm very against weight cutting having done it. Um, The toughness factor you gain from it, yes, that's undeniable. But – 
if you don't do it right, or even if you do it right and you do it for too long, you, you can have um, effects on your body that last a lifetime. And it's just not, you know, I don't think it's what people were meant to do. Um, and more so than that, if you, if you get too much time invested on cutting weight, that's what you're then losing time on doing training, learning. That's the most important thing to me is learning, you know, so, as much as I can. Anyways, I need to loop back. What about your dad and Dan Gable? So my dad, he wrestled at Iowa and Dan Gable coached him. Oh, I thought you said uh, Gable was his assistant coach. I was like, where did that occur? He was, he, no, no, no. He was my dad. So he was, sorry. He was a coach of my dad's. He was the assistant at the time, but he helped. He coached my dad. He was at Iowa. My dad was at Iowa. And so my dad had endless stories of me growing up. It was just the, you know, the good old days. Man, amazing. Um, so you must was, have been Hawkeye from like day one. I was a Hawkeye before I was born. When I was in my mama's <laughs> belly, I didn't have a choice, I'm sure. It ended up working out uh, pretty well. And uh, Matt, we really love having you on the site. We love the, your, out, your outlook on learning and the product that you made is absolutely fantastic. You've been really generous with your time. Uh, I want to give you a chance now if there's any like maybe sponsors or anybody you want to thank right now, feel free. Uh, and, and thank you. Just, uh, you know, always have to thank the, the Lord, the Lord God above. Um, I'm a strong believer. I, I don't, want to hide it i don't need to go preach i'm i'm not a preacher um but you know thank thank if you don't have a, a strong faith then thank those around you thank those that came before you thank those you learned from i thank all my coaches uh, over the years and certainly at this point i thank my wife for putting up with me um but it's been fun you know i'm very passionate i love this sport i love what i do um with wrestling and i encourage everyone to, to take a look at the bread mutter sweep single series um and you know what if that wasn't enough then i'll hope to to show you more um because i, I really enjoy it and anything i can do to to help people learn about this great sport whether you're a wrestler a grappler or just a individual trying to learn how to control someone else because it's nothing better than wrestling and, and grappling when it comes to that I totally agree. And for anybody that wants to check out Matt's series, you can check in the podcast show notes. Uh, there will be a link where you can follow to see his uh, series directly. Matt, you've been so generous with your time. Thanks for hopping on today. I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks a bunch. We'll catch you later, buddy. Talk to you soon, Matt. Yeah.